One of the best things about doing a PhD in physics is the amount of time it affords you to make your mornings your own, right? I woke up, I, I made my coffee, and I still don't even have to be in for class for another, oh, I have to leave. Okay, we'll catch up later. What's on the agenda for today, most of which you're not gonna see, unfortunately, is I'm going to ENM part two, which is electromagnetism, the sequel. And I also have to proctor an exam for modern physics because my professor is at a place I would rather be right now. Jefferson Lab. Did I say professor? I meant my advisor. I'm not taking the course. That would be pretty weird. <sighs> this is not how I wanted to start the day. Quick moment of silence for a fallen family member, Yeti mug. I left it on the hood of the car and I drove off. Yeti Mug was like a father to me. I loved him like a son. I did bring back up just in case, but I was hoping not to start using again. Man, that sucks. No time for grieving. It's just not what Yeti Mug would want. He would want me to print out my E&M homework though, so I'm gonna do that. Yeah, this one was particularly short. This one ended up being only six pages, so. Definitely can't complain. e and normally takes way longer, but still overall it hasn't been too terribly difficult. First one here, time for E&M. Mondays are seriously the best day of the week this semester, and that's not because I'm just one of those crazy people that's really into Mondays. I had to go to E&M, then I had to proctor an entire exam, then I got to meet with the professor to get some input on an application I'm submitting. I'm home now, and it's not even 12.30 yet. So everything that I had to get done on campus is already taken care of, and I still have the entire day. But uh, for the rest of the day, I'm gonna be working on an application for a summer school program at Jefferson Lab in nuclear physics. That's why I was meeting with a professor to get some input. Really, it was for the personal statement part, whether or not I should include that I do this whole thing. And uh, I guess the short answer was yes, I should. Just finished the application. That was way easier than I expected it to be. I guess I just had some kind of PTSD from when I was applying to grad school where you had to have like a personal statement and a statement of purpose. Don't ask me what the difference is, I don't remember, but no, this was straight to the point. So for now, for the rest of the day, I'm just gonna be doing some research. Believe me, I would love to explain exactly what it is that I do for research, but frankly, I only have this very abstract understanding of what it is that I do at the moment. Uh, maybe as these vlogs continue, or hopefully as these vlogs continue, I'll develop a deeper understanding of what it is that I do, and I can put it into actual words, but that's to be continued. Now, I may not be able to exactly explain what I do for research, but I can connect it to something that's more tangible. And luckily, there's a uh, there's a six-foot whiteboard right next to me that I'm, I'm gonna put to use. When it comes to fundamental research in physics, this stuff is pretty much always government funded. And when it comes to nuclear physics, there's this booklet, this manuscript that's published around every five years called the Long Range Plan. And in its essence, what it is, is it's a book that's filled with recommendations by nuclear physicists on where the government funding should go. What are the pressing unanswered questions in nuclear physics? Now, one of the unanswered questions you may be surprised to hear about has to do with where the proton gets its spin. Now, we've all seen this diagram before. We see the proton is made up of three quarks, two ups and a down. You add it up, you get the total spin of the proton. That's nice, it's simple, but it's actually wrong. And it's not very close to the right answer. As it turns out, most of the proton spin does not come from those three quarks. Now, how is it actually divided up? Well, we, well, we don't know. And currently, I'm working on two research projects, and both of which can be connected to this unanswered question in physics. If I pick up more projects along the way in the PhD, maybe they will connect to this, maybe they won't, but we can be damn sure that it'll connect to the long range plan. And that's really all I can say at this point. But without getting too technical, uh, my advisor gave me a couple thousand lines of code in Fortran that has to do with calculating certain cross sections. And he just asked me to go through it and try to make sense of what all the different subroutines are doing. I think I've, I've done all of that. I understand more or less what the code is calculating. I think in the meantime, what I'm gonna be doing is putting some of it into Python just so I can plot some stuff out and get some more intuition visually with what all this stuff means. But that's probably just boring detail that you don't wanna see. So we'll pick this up tomorrow where I only have one class, computational physics, at noon. 
Uh, maybe I'll introduce you to some people in the department. Before I go to class and find out how pooters make physics easier, I have to go drop something off at the astronomy building for Kelly. Here you go. Thank you. See you. Bye. Bye. Love you. I've got about 20 minutes before my computational physics class. Um, this semester only having two classes definitely has its benefits because I can finally focus on research a lot more. However, I am still a TA, which means grading homework still, and exams. Now the my advisor slash the professor's out of town, so things are a little bit hectic for him, so uh, before I get to grading these exams and homeworks, I actually have to take them myself so that I know what the answers are. Luckily, it's just on special relativity. I do this stuff every day, so it shouldn't take too long. I do not feel like grading anymore. I feel like doing a little bit of research. Uh, the code that I was talking about yesterday that's in Fortran, one of the subroutines or the packages that it uses uh, was written in 2002. And I just got the okay to modernize this code and try to put it into Python. I think that's what I'm gonna be doing over the next week or so. Without getting too into it, in nuclear physics experiments and theoretical calculations, it always comes down to cross sections. If you're unfamiliar with a cross section, it gives you information about how probable a certain process is to happen in a scattering experiment, say. And for what we do, we can always split it into two terms. One that is perturbative, meaning we can exactly find out what the answer almost is, times something that is not perturbative. We can't use perturbation theory to calculate what it is, but it's universal. It doesn't depend on the specific process, so we can maybe measure the cross-section for a different process and then do a fit to find out what this guy is. What this guy is, it's called a parton distribution function. The name's not going to do you any good, and these are called partonic cross-sections. Uh, so what I'm trying to do, I know how to code this guy, I know how to calculate this guy if I have the two of them. I just don't know quite yet how to extract these PDFs. That's gonna be the name of the game for the next week or so. But one of the great things about being a theory student is I don't actually need to be on campus or in a lab to do any of this stuff. I just, I just need my laptop and maybe a few sheets of paper. So with that being said, I'm gonna get to coding in the comfort of my own home. Uh, whoever invented mornings was a real a-hole. Uh, it's 7.30 in the morning on a Wednesday. I have e &M at 9. I woke up a bit early just so that I could start poking around with the code a little bit more. I figured that the hard part of translating the code from Fortran to Python would be moving this guy over, these PDFs, because for one, it provides this data set of function evaluations, of, of function values, uh, and then you have to interpolate the rest. The only thing is it gives you a bunch of function values, but it doesn't say evaluated at what. Am I holding Q the Q constant or X? What those mean necessarily, don't worry about it. But that's what I'm trying to figure out at the moment. I don't have too much time though, so at least it gives me a goal for the rest of the day. Also today, I am finally moving over my binders full of course notes over from my apartment to the office so I can get back some of that valuable bookshelf space. Mau Mau does not want me to leave. Are you hungry? Yeah. Cool. cool. Krishna, get the... <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm tired of not knowing what to do with this code, so we're gonna go get some, probably Panda. Over lunch, Andrew gave me some uh, nice advice on how I should approach the rest of this code. Uh, namely, print it out and do comments on paper rather than try to just internalize what it's all doing at once. So that's what I'm gonna be doing now. Excuse me, can I help you? Um, I was putting off going through the interpolation routine itself because... Hi. Hi. Because I figured it would describe what the data set was actually, what it meant before going to the interpolation, which does not seem to be the case. So now it's time to just bite the bullet and go through the entire code. Probably should have done that from the get-go, but I guess I was being lazy. Okay, it is Thursday. I've been digging through this data file and the source code all night, uh, but I finally made some progress. I still don't understand it completely, but I know what has to be there now. It's uh, 
I won't be able to do much research at all today because Thursdays are actually busier for me and the rest of the week hasn't really been. But I have to go to class soon, then I have to give my weekly supplemental instruction lecture for modern physics, then I have to tutor, then there's a colloquium, and then I have to go to this outreach program from like 6 to 7.30 or something. So I'll record as much as I can, but depending on the setting it might not be too appropriate. So we'll see. If you're unfamiliar with what supplemental instruction is, basically if there's a course that has it, there's the regular course that all of the students take, and then there's an additional one credit class where the students can get extra practice for that. And that's typically taught by a grad student. So I'm the supplemental instructor for modern physics. That's the student's first exposure to things like relativity and quantum. And I have to give one of my sessions today. Since they haven't learned too much since their last exam. I figured no one would complain if I actually just went over the exam. So I just made sure that I solved all of the problems. I know what all of the tricks are. Uh, and I think they'll appreciate that, but I have a little bit of time before computational. I guess I'll just, uh, let's, let's be honest, I'll go back to coding. The crappy thing about trying to do a vlog on a Thursday is that it's such a busy day for me, but everything is back to back to back. So I feel like I could record a lot of stuff because it's eventful, but there's no in time in between to do so. But anyways, I'm done with everything for the day for the most part. I'm about to go volunteer for this outreach event at a museum. I can't really bring my camera into that because there's a bunch of children and something tells me going up to parents being like, hey, can I put your kids on camera? Don't worry, it's for the internet. You just can't ask to record kids and look like me. So I guess I'll see you guys after that. Ah, after a long morning and an even longer last night, I finally understand the data file that I've been working with. Turns out, so in the source code it says we're not considering top quarks, which leaves five quark flavors, up, down, strange, charm, and bottom. Now the data file that contains the parton distributions was split into five columns of data, so I naively assumed that that corresponded to an up quark distribution, down quark, and so on. But that's not what it actually corresponded to. You see, these columns of data weren't columns at all, they were just large space separated values. It was just one big list. And after I understood this, I tested that theory and I plotted out what I would think the parton distribution function would be under these assumptions, and it looks something like this for the up quark, which is exactly what it should look like. You have a peak at a bit less than a third. That's because if you think about a proton being made up of you know, three quarks, you would think that each one would carry about a third of the total momentum of the proton, but if you factor in that there are particle-antiparticle pairs popping in and out and gluons being exchanged, those also share a tiny amount of that total momentum, bringing it down from a third to a bit less. And now I can finally start the project of translating this stuff into Python. It's about 11 a.m. right now. The only other thing on the agenda for the day is I have a PGSO meeting at 4.30, PGSO being physics grad student organization. And every now and then we have faculty members present their research to the grad students and they say that so that we know what's going on at the department. This week my advisor is presenting his research to us, so I'm gonna go there and, and cheer him on. Okay, we just finished our PGSO meeting. My advisor gave a presentation on what he does for research. Uh, for those of you who are a bit unfamiliar about what PGSO is, if you're a grad student in physics, you've probably heard of SPS, the Society of Physics Students. This is the Physics Grad Student Organization. So this is our president, Jorge, if you Hello. want to say a few words about what PGSO is. It's basically the grown-up version of SPS, and uh, usually it's more carefree, not more casual because, you know, as grad students, we're normally busier. Sure. We have research, TA, TA duties, classes, we don't do as big or often projects as the undergrad uh, club, but we do more uh, physics involved. So right now what we have is each month we try to bring a faculty uh, to present the research for us. That way we can get to know what our department does research-wise, and graduate students know who they could work with. And then the, that, now there's the semesterly get-together at my house. So hopefully that continues on. Oh yeah, raging hard, that's part of the graduate <laughs> too. <laughs> we need any excuse to drink. Uh, but yeah, if you're interested in going to grad school, you know, the organization doesn't die with undergrad. There's still places to go, you know, so you don't have to take it on all by yourself. 
With that being said, I'm gonna get home and take some allergy medicine. So I think that this has been a pretty average week for me as a graduate physics student. I spoke to a bunch of people at the PGSO meeting who said that they would be down to, why are you wet, dude? Why are you always wet? But they said that they'd be down to be part of these videos in the future, so as they make more, it won't just be me talking about figuring out how a code works or something like that. You'll hear from other people, which I think will be much more interesting. But either way, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. Let me know in the comment section if you did, and I'll see you guys there.